The grey whale was wiped out in the North Atlantic Ocean long ago. The Pacific population very nearly went the same way, but it made a remarkable recovery. Considering the years of persecution they suffered, these whales show some remarkable behaviour towards people and boats. The grey whale's annual migration route up and down the densely populated west coast of North America makes it one of the best known of all whales. It is an ideal subject for study by whale watchers and by scientists. However, much of its behaviour is still a mystery. When the whalers attacked them, grey whales used to fight back. They became known as devilfish. Now they seem to have become playful, and people know them for their curiosity. Grey whales suffered severely and very suddenly at the hands of the whaling industry. Between 1845 and 1874, about 11,000 grey whales were killed by commercial whalers, out of a stock of about 24,000. The slaughter slowed down after that, but by 1946, when they were guaranteed protection from commercial whaling, there were only 4,000 grey whales left. Since they have been protected, they have recovered at an amazing rate. To update records of what they do, where they go, and how numerous they are, Dr. Stephen Swartz has tagged some of them with radio transmitters. The transmitter is built into a boat which can be fired from a crossbow. The whale has become accustomed to the sound of the ship's motor and the marksman can get within range. It is easy to see how whale hunters nearly wiped out these gentle giants but the researcher's boat causes the whale no harm. Radio tagging has shown that the whales swim at an average six kilometers per hour, day and night. The present world population is now estimated at about 23,000. Most grey whales spend the summer in the high Arctic, but a few hundred stay to feed in the southern part of their range, somewhere between Alaska and Mexico's Baja Peninsula. The grey is a baleen whale, which has filtering plates instead of teeth. It can feed at the surface or in mid-water, like humpback or right whales, but it can also feed from the bottom. It sucks mud into its mouth and forces it out over the sieve-like baleen plates to filter out the crustaceans which live in it.
Studies on dead whales show that the baleen plates are usually more worn on one side of the mouth than on the other. Also, the same side of the head has fewer barnacles. This suggests that individual whales are either right-handed or left-handed, with the majority using the right side of their faces to feed. Plowing up the seabed like this encourages the growth of the whale's food supply. New colonies of crustaceans become established in the craters dug by the whales. Every grey whale sieves up nearly half a tonne of food every day during its five months in the Arctic. Between them, they remove about a tenth of the stock of crustaceans every year, but because of their digging, the food supply remains steady. The first people to hunt grey whales were the northwest coastal Indians and the native people of Siberia. Their hunting weapons were simple but effective. The head of the harpoon was made from the shell of a large mussel, which was designed to be socketed onto a shaft. The blunt barbs were made from elk antlers and the rope from cedar bark and sinews. They probably wounded more whales than they could land. It could take four days to drag a whale ashore using two or more canoes. The International Whaling Commission classifies the eastern northern Pacific population of grey whales as a management stock but only allows about 160 to be harvested annually in Russia as food for the Siberian Eskimos. Grey whales migrate along the continental shelf of the west coast, southwards for 8,000 kilometers, from the Arctic Ocean to the Baja Peninsula in Mexico. The pregnant females lead the way and the juveniles bring up the rear. Their journey begins in autumn, when they leave the Arctic waters north of Alaska. They make their way through Unimac Pass in western Alaska and hug the shore southwards down the western coast of British Columbia. Throughout their range, grey whales are at risk from human activities, especially those of inshore fishermen. The waters are littered with gill nets, lobster and crab pots and all kinds of marine debris. Sometimes young whales play with the ropes and nets so that they become tangled round their flukes or in their baleen. At other times, they become entangled in passing. However it is caused, if the whale cannot rid itself of its encumbrance, it will become exhausted and die. Threats to the whales resulting from their migration so near to the shore include disturbance by shipping and by offshore drilling for gas and oil. Whale watching is a popular pastime all along the route, from Oregon to Mexico. Off the coast of central California, at the height of the migration, between 350 and 400 whales pass every 24 hours. The whales move steadily at between three and four knots. 
Their journey from Unimac Pass, Alaska, to Baja California in subtropical Mexico takes an average of 90 days. Opposite the coast of Southern California, where the sea bottom has deep troughs and there are numerous small islands, the whales move away from the shore, coming closer in when they reach the Mexican border. Some of the pregnant females give birth before reaching Mexico, which puts the calves in danger. Out at sea, the youngsters are sometimes attacked by the grey whale's only natural predator. Killer whales, which are also called orcas, are now known to be intelligent social animals with a well-developed family life. They are also the ocean's largest and most widespread predator of other marine mammals. Grey whale calves are defenseless and easy prey for orcas. If recorded orca calls are played back underwater, grey whales retreat from the sounds. The evidence of these attacks can be seen in the tooth marks on flukes and fins, the signature of the killer whale. Most of the grey whales arrive off the coast of Baja California in late January or February. They head inshore at a place where warm, shallow lagoons reach deep into the desert. These are their traditional sanctuaries, where individual females give birth and mate in alternate years. Between 1840 and the late 1870s, commercial whalers came to these lagoons to hunt the grey whales. Charles Scammon, a whaling captain who later turned naturalist, commemorated the scene in his classic book on marine mammals. He was among the first to take his ship through the breakers and into the lagoon, where his crews wrought havoc among the mothers and their calves. They used to harpoon the calves first, so as to lure the mothers within range. In the battles which resulted, boats were smashed and men were killed by the whales. The whales are protected now. This piece of baleen came from a whale which died of natural causes. Now that the hunt is over, the lagoons are once more safe for the whales. There are nursery areas where mothers can rear their calves away from the turmoil of the courtship activities in the main lagoons. In 1972, the Mexican government declared Scammons and Black Warrior Lagoons national whale sanctuaries. In 1979, a third lagoon, Laguna San Ignacio, was added to the list. From mid-December to mid-March each year, fishing is banned or restricted so that the whales are left undisturbed. The whales spend between four and six weeks here, but they rarely feed. There's little or no food here of the kind which they could exploit, though some people have seen what look like attempts to filter food from the water. All whales have a few vestigial hairs, reminders of their descent from land mammals. Grey whales have a line of bristles along the lower jaw and a few on the head. It's not known if they have any significant function. One very notable feature of grey whales is the barnacles which attach themselves to their skin. This species is found only on grey whales. 
People have said that the barnacles irritate the whale, but there's no real evidence either way. Among the barnacles, every whale carries hundreds of whale lice, crustaceans which feed on the damaged skin. Opinions differ, but some scientists maintain that the lice eventually cause the barnacle to drop off, thus doing the whale a favour. Pale whitish patches on the skin of the head are the scars where old barnacles have dropped off. The barnacles are mostly on the left-hand side of the whale's head, because those on the right are scraped off during its feeding dives in the Arctic. The lagoon waters are swarming with barnacle larvae, and the calves become infested with barnacles by the end of their first month. Most of the calves are born in January as soon as the females arrive and in the quiet innermost reaches of the lagoons. They stay very close to their mothers for the first few months, but here in the lagoons they are sheltered from rough seas as well as from sharks and killer whales. At birth, the calf measures about four and a half meters long, but by the time it's a year old, it will have doubled its length and trebled its weight. Grey whale milk is very rich and contains 50% fat. It's been estimated that a calf can gain weight at a rate of half a kilogram per hour. Because half the females are giving birth every year and will not mate until the following year, there is considerable competition among the males in the outer lagoon to mate with the remaining females. It is important that the females mate early in the season so that next year's calves will be born as soon as possible after their mothers arrive at the lagoon. Pregnancy in grey whales lasts between a year and 13 months. Grey whales, like right whales, are promiscuous. Their courting groups may contain as many as 20 animals, involved in a tumultuous mating which can go on for hours. The spectacle of whales at close quarters has become a multi-million dollar business in the last 10 years, making it more profitable than the old commercial whale fishery. Since the early 1970s, whale watching cruises have been bringing people to the Mexican lagoons. To see a whale at sea is exciting, but views as close as this are unforgettable. In 1975, in San Ignacio Lagoon, a new phenomenon was reported. The occurrence of curious or friendly whales. Some of the whales deliberately swim close to small boats and even hold out their heads to be patted. Others actually play with the boats.
It's hard to believe that these were the animals which wrecked Scammon's whale boats and killed his men. They must have been terrified and desperate. When treated with respect, these whales have proved harmless and friendly, if a little boisterous. Why they behave like this is unknown, although curiosity probably instigated the behavior. In February, pregnant females, males and immature whales begin to leave the lagoons to start the journey north. The females with calves stay behind for another month or more until the babies are strong enough to leave. The females are thought to try to prepare their offspring for the journey by leading them into the tide races at the mouth of the lagoon. It's as if they were forcing them to swim hard in order to get them fit enough to cope with ocean currents and rough weather. The easy life of the lagoons is at an end, and the long trek north must begin. Still playful, the calves follow their mothers out to the open sea, heading for the first time towards the icy north. Whale population seems to be levelling off at about 23,000 animals, which is believed to be close to what it might have been before the carnage of the 19th century. This is an amazing recovery, considering that there were only 4,000 in 1946. is still threatened by pollution and by disturbance from human activities at sea. Only when they too have been brought under control will the future of this curious whale be secure.